Well, good morning, church family. I guess you're probably wondering why I am appearing on the video screen and not in the sanctuary. Well, I think I mentioned last week that uh, I had a cold, and I think you probably know Janet has had a cold as well. Well, uh, we have, uh, I, I've had this cold for like two weeks, uh, cough, no fever, all that kind of stuff, tested multiple times for COVID, all those tests are negative. Uh, Phoebe's had a little bit of a sickness and went to the doctor and uh, she's tested negative and Janet came down with it several days ago and was doing, you know, pretty good. Um, but uh, her cough kind of took a turn for the worse Saturday afternoon. So right before bed at like 11 o'clock, we decided maybe it'd be a good idea to test her for COVID and she was positive. And I just uh, was stunned. We were all just like shocked. And um, I guess for uh, out of an abundance of caution, we decided not to come in today. Uh, of course, she wouldn't being covid and and not feeling great at all. Uh, but me too, with symptoms and Phoebe with symptoms, maybe we just thought it was best to stay home and uh, not share our germs. We did come to the breakfast yesterday and I, I feel like we did our due diligence. We, we, we did the COVID test. We went to the doctor, talked to the doctor. Janet had a doctor appointment on a Friday and uh, look, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I try to be so careful COVID wise, but uh, anyway, this is a shocking event to us, and you don't want to hear about that anymore, but we do want to talk about uh, the great and terrible day of the Lord. Before I do that, I want to pray. Also, I want to thank Sharam for cooking yesterday, and uh, Sharam and Kevin and Jesse and the team that uh, Nick, I think, and probably other people too. Uh, we just had a great breakfast yesterday, and hope we didn't share any germs, but we did share a great time with you guys. It was awesome. We're going to be doing that again, and uh, just thank you, Sharam. Um, thank you for everybody that helped clean and uh, uh, cook and all that kind of good stuff. We do not have any midweek uh, meet gatherings this week. This is our off week, uh, not because anybody's sick, but that it's just kind of built in. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that we're going to dig into today. Uh, thank you for uh, you, the promise of your coming, your kindness and your goodness. Lord, I pray that we would uh, hear from you today, that you would encourage us by your word, uh, that you would heal those that are sick and Janet, uh, especially with her birthday coming up this week, and that your grace would just cover our church in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> so if you got a Bible. We're in Joel chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Uh, this is right around the time uh, in our Bible reading plan that we should be reading Joel. So this should be apropos. Uh, let's read Joel chapter one, verse two. And in fact, I'm just going to skip around Joel a little bit because I want to get some scripture in us about the day of the Lord. And Joel one, one says, woe because of that day for the day of the Lord is near and will come as devastation from the almighty Blow the horn in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and dense overcast. Skip down to verse 11. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awe-inspiring day of the Lord comes. So this week we are continuing our journey through following Christ in the Old Testament. And I'm, I'm sad to say it, we're almost done with the Old Testament. And I'm sad to say it because there's so much stuff left to talk about. So many uh, so many concepts and truths and depth of knowledge about God. And we'll be in the New Testament in a few weeks, and maybe we'll just circle around and cover it next year. But uh, one of the prominent themes in the Bible, one I haven't preached about an awful lot, is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord in the Bible appears in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Sometimes it's called that day or the great day uh, or variations like that. But the phrase, the day of the Lord, or similar kind of phrases appears around a hundred times in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but nowhere does the uh, Bible talk more about the great day of the Lord than in the book of Joel, which is interesting because uh, Joel talks about the day of the Lord five different times, even though Joel is a very short book, only three chapters, but it was a very important book to the early church because Peter, in the first sermon <clears throat> ever preached to the gathered church, 
the first scripture that was ever cited was from Joel chapter 2 and was talking about the great day of the Lord. So if you got your Bible, let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 14. It's the day of Pentecost. Jesus has told his disciples to stay and pray until the Holy Spirit clothes them with power from on high. That happens. The people spill out into the street, tongues of fire on their head. They're speaking in other languages about Jesus. And verse 14 says, Peter stood up, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, men of Judah, these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So that is the great and terrible day of the Lord. So three foundational truths we need to see about the great and terrible day of the Lord. Number one, there's a lot of events in the Bible that's talked about, all kind of lumped into the end times, that seem to basically align with each other in terms of when they might occur. They appear to be roughly concurrent, though not happening at the exact same time. For instance, uh, if you're a history buff and I talk about the Battle of the Bulge or Pearl Harbor or Iwo Jima or the Battle of Dunkirk or the Battle of Stalingrad, you probably know all five of those battles are World War II battles. And in kind of our minds, we lump them together as all happening during World War II. But those five battles took place over a period of about five years, and uh, they were separated from each other by as much as 7,500 miles away. Uh, so it's, so these things happen at a great distance. If you're living through those battles during World War II, you don't consider that all part of World War II. You consider those different things happening in different places. And I think the last days are similar. If we happen to live through the last days, these things that are uh, all the Bible talks about will feel like different events, but they all kind of fit into that one thing, the the end of time, the return of Jesus. So some of the events I'm referring to include what we're talking about today, the great and terrible day of the Lord, or the last days, or the second coming, the end of the age, the return of Jesus, the, the great tribulation, the end times, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the rise of the Antichrist, and even the Armageddon battle, all of those things appear in Scripture to take place at roughly the same time. So the second foundational truth about the great and terrible day of the Lord. We are not meant to know the timing of the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus. Um, the thing is, this information, it's not hidden in the Bible. It's not like a, a encoded or something like that where we can calculate it or figure it out. Your guess is as good as mine. And a lot of Bible passages make this clear. Now, I've talked about this before, but it's worth talking about again, that we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And here's some verses that kind of clue us in that we're not going to know. Daniel 8, 26. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. Now you must seal up the vision because it refers to many days in the future. So Daniel sees something, but he's told not to write about it. He's told to seal it up. Daniel 12, 4. But you, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about and knowledge will increase. Or Daniel 12, 9. He said, go on your way, Daniel, for the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end. They won't always be secret, but they are secret now. Zechariah 14, 7, talking about the day of the Lord. It will be a day known only to Yahweh without day or night, but there will be light at evening. That's interesting. Matthew 24, 36. This is Jesus talking. He says, now concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the sun. Jesus didn't know. 
But he says, except the Father only. Matthew 24, same chapter, different verse, verse 44. This is why you must also, also be ready, says Jesus, because the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Matthew 24, 50. That slave's master will come on a day he does not expect and in an hour he does not know. So three times in Matthew 24, Jesus tells us that we are not going to know the dates and times of his return. And if that's not enough for us, in the very next chapter, Matthew 25, 13, Jesus says, therefore, be alert because you don't know either the day or the hour. Keeping on going, Acts 1, 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. One more, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 and 2, about the times and the seasons, brothers, you do not need anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know, says Paul, very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So here's the net result of that. Everything in the Bible is equally true, but not everything in the Bible is equally clear. There are places where people disagree on biblical things because, honestly, the truth is hard for them or it's unpalatable. They don't want to deal with it, so they disagree about it because it would be easier to think of it in less than biblical terms. But eschatology, the study of the end times, it's not that. The fact of the matter is it's one of these places where the Bible just isn't terribly clear biblically, and as we've been told, it's not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be able to figure some of these things out. So godly, fervent students of the Bible might disagree on the end times. And I've actually heard it said, talking about the millennial reign and uh, re talked about in Revelation chapter 20, uh, that the millennial reign is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about because there's all sorts of uh, interpretations on what the day of the Lord means and what the millennial reign is, uh, all that kind of stuff. But we have to discuss the last days with a shovel and with humility. And I mean a shovel because we need to dig into the Bible to really understand what it teaches about the last days. There are at least a hundred chapters in the Bible whose primary theme is talking about the last days. So we're going to need a shovel to dig through all of that. We're going to need humility because lots of people who have come before us have made some egregious errors about the second coming of Jesus and about the last day. So my theory on the end times is that God's teaching in the Bible is purposely designed so that the closer we get to the end times, the clearer it will be. Uh, and, and so we will begin to understand it a little more as that day draws near. Daniel 12, 4 kind of implies that to me when Michael says to Daniel, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about and knowledge will increase. So that whole business of sealing the book until the time of the end, that seems to indicate that uh, at the end, when Jesus is preparing to come back, perhaps there will be some level of unsealing of what the Bible has to say about that. I don't know, like the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now we see but a poor reflection as if looking through a mirror. So these kind of things, we don't see them clearly, but we can know some things about the last days and about the great and terrible day of the Lord. And including in that is number three, what we need to know about the day of the Lord. And that is, it is great and it is terrible. Well, of course, duh, but it might not be so obvious to understand why. Why is the day of the Lord great? Because it is deliverance and salvation for God's people. Why is it terrible? Because it will be a terrifying time of violence and judgment for those that are not in Christ. So it's going to be very scary. Some verses that tell us that include Isaiah 34, I'm sorry, Isaiah 13, verse 9, which says, Look, the day of the Lord is coming cruel with rage and burning anger to make the earth a desolation and to destroy the sinners on it. Revelation 6.15 is talking about the day of the Lord. And it says the kings of the earth, the nobles, the military commanders, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb because 
The great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So in a sense, the day of the Lord is going to be terrible and terrifying, but in a sense, it's going to be wonderful. And Jesus perfectly captures that dynamic for us in a passage like Luke 21, verse 25, which says this, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and there will be anguish on the earth among nations, bewildered by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and expectation of the things that are coming on the world because the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is near. So this is how the world ends. This is how history terminates. This is how evil is defeated. This is how every tear is wiped from every eye. It's how death is destroyed. It's going to be terrible at first. And then it's going to be great for those who are in Christ, which is again why Joel 2.31 calls it the great and terrible day of the Lord. And Joel says, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So how do we prepare for and survive the great and terrible day of the Lord? Well, two ways. Number one, we shelter in Jesus. And number two, we listen to Jesus. Let me say that again, two ways. Number one, we shelter in Jesus. Number two, we listen to Jesus. So first and foremost, we shelter in Jesus. What are we hiding from when we shelter in Jesus? Well, it turns out we're hiding from the wrath of God on the day of the Lord. We talked a little bit about that the last couple of weeks. First Thessalonians 1.10, Paul talks about waiting for Jesus, his son from heaven, whom he raised from de the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are in Christ, sheltering in him by faith, you will be protected on the great and terrible day of the Lord. Pastor David McConnell says this, Who survives the day of the Lord? Not the good, not the moral, not the religious, not the rich. The day of the Lord is survived by the dependent, the ones who turn from their sin in order to faithfully pursue Christ in whom they entrusted their souls. The ones who can say in agreement with Titus chapter 3, verse 4, which says, talk, Paul speaking, at one time I was foolish, disobedient, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, but when the kindness and love of God, my Savior, appeared, he saved me. Not because of the righteous things I had done, but because of his mercy. So the day of the Lord is survived by people who are dependent on the Lord, on his mercy, and on his salvation through Jesus. Now, how else do we survive the day of the Lord? We will shelter in Jesus, number one, trusting in him by faith to save us. Number two, we listen to Jesus. Now, Mark chapter four seems to speak so directly to us in California, because here in California, life is fast paced. People are busy, so busy. We've got so much stuff going on. We have got our fingers and everything in California. And this is a warning that Jesus would give to people like us who are so busy. Mark 4.14 4, says, Jesus is speaking. He says, the sower, the, the teacher sows the word. These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear immediately Satan and comes and takes the word away from them. So we can hear the word and we can have it snatched away by Satan. Skip down to verse 18, which is the one that really kind of targets us Californians. It's Jesus said, others are sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, God's word, but the worries of this age, the seduction of wealth and the desire for other things enters in and chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. 
So honestly, I fear here, I fear this for my family. I fear it for your family that we are pulled in so many directions to the point that we're raising really well-rounded children in so many ways, but ones that only have a small amount of time and room for Jesus. Um, the day of the Lord should force us to focus and listen to the words that J Jesus says. Uh, I, Chloe was, uh, Chloe's home for this week. I was hoping she'd be able to come to church today, but probably won't be able to with uh, whatever we're dealing with here in the Thompson household. But Chloe goes to St. Catherine's in San Marcos, which is right next to San Diego. That is an Orthodox school, Orthodox Christian. And I don't know if you know much about Orthodox Christianity. They're uh, kind of halfway between Protestant and Catholic, and they do a lot of the liturgical things that uh, the Catholic Church does. And Chloe was telling me about her schedule this week, and I have permission to share this story, uh, about kind of how things go at school. And I thought it was very interesting because it, it reminded me so much of how we live our lives in California. She goes to her classes, she goes to soccer, and they go to chapel because it's a Christian school. It's an Orthodox Christian school. And she said it's pretty different. And I have a lot of respect for uh, Orthodox Christianity. It's very old and uh it's very interesting to me but she said one of the, in one of the chapels uh at the end the uh and i don't know if the right name is priest i don't think it's a pastor so we'll call him a priest he was in a black robe he came around with holy water like real holy water that they prayed over and they splashed it on everybody while they were praying for people now I'm as interested in holy water as you are. And if we had vampires attacking right now, I would hope to get my squirt gun filled with holy water to squirt on them. But honestly, what good is water going to do to splash on people? N nothing. You don't see Jesus doing stuff like that. You don't see the disciples doing stuff like that. The fact of the matter is it's a religious thing that doesn't come from the Bible that we probably do just kind of to make ourselves feel good. Now, I understand. I think that's called the aspersion of the water or something like that. Uh, it's 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 You do it while you're blessing people. That's meaningful. Blessing people is meaningful. Splashing water on them or dancing some sort of dance or uh, being dressed in some sort of robe when you do it, that's probably not very spiritually meaningful, but it looks religious. And as I listen to Chloe's schedule and how they do things at that school, I just thought, you know, they're Christian. They give a sliver of their time every week to going to chapel and doing Christian things, maybe an hour or two a week. And I feel like that's such a way that we Californians live our life. We give a sliver of our time to Jesus. I don't know if you saw that app that was super popular like uh, a few years ago. It was called A Sprinkle of Jesus. And it would give you like uh, an encouraging word every day or something like that. Um, I never had the a Sprinkle of Jesus app. And one of the reasons I didn't, because it wasn't actually Jesus they were quoting. It was like, I don't know, feel good kind of stuff, uh, like pet a dog today and and, and love people because they deserve it, signed Jesus. Well, Jesus didn't say stuff like that. Occasionally they would do scripture, but I think we've kind of got a sprinkle of Jesus society going on in California in that we're very much like the people described in Mark chapter four, the worries of this age focusing on other things. We're really well-rounded. We're good at a lot of things, but are we following Jesus wholeheartedly? I want you to keep that in mind as I le read this last warning of Jesus. It's in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, worth looking up in your Bible if you have it near you. Ask yourself, let this command of Jesus for you and for me be a measuring stick for how we're living our life and whether or not we're ready for the great and terrible day of the Lord. This is what Jesus says about his second coming. He says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants 
servants. In other words, the people who are wide awake and doing the things of Jesus when he comes back, Jesus says they're blessed. But verse 39, know this, if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let, left his house to be broken into. You must also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That's what Jesus says. Now, I dare you to keep reading in that passage and you'll find out what Jesus is going to say to the people who are not ready for his coming. It's kind of terrifying. It's not pretty. So how do we respond to a message like this about the great and terrible day of the Lord? Well, again, number one, we shelter in Jesus. We run to him. We believe in him by faith. We flee to him, trusting in him to save us. Not our good works, not anything we can do, not whether or not we're Sunday school teachers or elders or deacons or whatever, but trusting in him and what he did for us on the cross by sacrificing himself, breaking his body, pouring out his blood for our sins. So we shelter in him for the great and terrible day of the Lord. We'll be safe in him. If we shelter anywhere else, we're doomed. So number one, we shelter in Jesus. Number two, we listen to his word. We listen to his call on our lives to be focused on the work of Christ so that when he comes, and we don't know when he's going to come, when he comes, we are doing the things of the kingdom and not doing literally everything else. Now, I'm not saying you can't do other things sometimes. I am saying that Jesus is Lord. And him being Lord means that we may not be well-rounded people in every single thing. It probably means we need to prioritize our walk with him. So let me urge you, to do that today. Look to Jesus, follow him with your life, consider your time and how you spend it, and consider his lordship over your life. Let's pray. Father, I ask that this word would stick in our hearts, that you would grow us in the faith, that we would listen to your words, we would shelter in you, trusting in you by faith to save us. Lord, I pray you to bless the family of Valley Baptist Church. Help us to be fruitful. Help us to follow you all of our days, Lord. Help us to be kind and loving. Help us to walk in holiness and Christ-pleasing. Oh, Lord, help us today to uh, reach out to new people and to share your word to a city that needs to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Uh, and uh, sorry to not see you today. We miss you. Give us a text. Give us an email. Let us know how you're doing, and we will be praying for you. Good day and Godspeed.